So welcome everyone to the ArtsLink Assembly. My name is Simon Dav. I'm the director of CEC ArtsLink. Uh, the ArtsLink Assembly is our annual gathering of artists and colleagues to look at the way artists are working to address some of the key issues that face us as, a, as an evolving human project, perhaps, and, and certainly facing civil society. Today is the final day of the assembly. We've had five weeks of uh, weekly sessions. All of them are recorded now and available on the website uh, at ccartslink.org. So if you uh, need to revisit some of them or to revisit this one, please uh, visit the website when you can. They'll be there in perpetuity, or at least uh, that's what we used to think um, this year the pandemic and the changes have really uh, affected what we think of as perpetuity these days. And that's really why we're gathered today. Uh, I've, I've invited a range of artists and organizers, uh, artists who are running uh, networks or connected with independent artists, working in many ways in many parts of the world to share with us really the impact of what has been happening in the last uh, nine months now. Uh, the global pandemic, but of course the fallout from that, which is the, the massive impact it's having on, on the economy, on mobility, on transport. Uh, and, and that's not to mention the increasing geopolitical tensions that we're seeing around the world leading to all kinds of conflict and restrictions. So I'd like to welcome everyone uh, today there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. You can write them in the Q&A box. If you're part of the Zoom uh, webinar, you can add questions to the Q&A box and we'll get to them towards the end of our discussion. But let me uh, now welcome everyone. And I think it would be helpful for the viewers if we just go through uh, everyone who's here, where you are, where you're working, where you're connected with and the kind of work you're doing, just to give us all a clear context uh, for the things that you'll be sharing with us later. So can we start with uh, Gulnara and Muratbek? You need to uh, unmute your microphone. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a very pleasure to see you all of, uh, in this uh, very interesting <laughs> Um, group. So I'm an artist and also co-founder of Artist. Uh, we are working together with my uh, partner. Uh, uh, we are doer as an artist and also as uh, uh, organizers. Uh, so um, actually I'm finished the Moscow uh, Surikov Institute and after that I begin work not uh, in classical but more in contemporary art because in that time uh, Soviet uh, Union collapsing and a lot of uh, turbulent uh, issues and I can't work like as a painter. So we, we are now working together with Murat Beck as a video artist and also seems that uh, all these institutions collapse in uh, Kyrgyzstan and we have to do something for cultural uh, movement and uh, uh, make some uh, things to full fill the gap which uh, um, um, which uh, uh, appear in that uh, in that time so we organized there as artist NGO in 2003 and uh, and um, I carry out uh, a lot of uh, international exhibitions and school for contemporary art for young generation. Um, so, yeah. Nana, can I ask, you're, you're based in Kyrgyzstan, but you're working with many countries in uh, Central Asia, is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, but we, we're based in Kyrgyzstan. And, and where, where are you connecting with mostly? Well, uh, actually, in the beginning, uh, we, start, uh, we, uh, we used to study in uh, Moscow and uh, through that we, <laughs> we know a lot of uh, our friends, artists from Central Asia and all over the post-Soviet, post -Soviet, even not only post-Soviet, also abroad. 
Great. Okay, we'll come back to you to look at how that work is changing this year, but let's finish the introduction. So, uh, Susan. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Susan Katz, and I'm Program Director for CAC Arts Link and direct our office in St. Petersburg. And my work is mostly around exchanges in the countries of the former Soviet Union and working both with US artists who come to St. Petersburg for residencies and um, doing projects in St. Petersburg, um, focusing mostly on socially engaged art and public art. And about four years ago, we created a network of organizations in 11 countries of the former Soviet Union that focuses on socially engaged art and public art practices. And Murat Beck and Gulnara are members of this network that's called the Art Prospect Network. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Jenny. Um, let me see, okay, okay. Hello, my name, thank you very much for uh, Simon and everybody for being part of this Thank amazing you for joining us. discussion. Thank you. Um, my name is Jenny Marchetto. I am uh, an artist, I'm a researcher, and also at the moment I'm a professor at the New School for Social Research. And also I was born in Athens, Greece. I'm based in New York. However, I spent a lot of time in Athens and in Greece doing projects. Um, I would say that my work is socially engaged, is also about creating strategies and how to imagine new structures of meaning where art creates places and events where people embodied being together and thinking about what realities need to practice and to share and take time and the freedom to imagine. And I do that by organizing workshops. I produce public actions, radio broadcast, archives and exhibitions. And, I very, and I'm very much interested in pedagogical models through the framework of contemporary art. Recently, uh, because I, as I said, I spent a lot of time in Athens and I realized the, 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 the needs that are there, especially in relationship to youth, I have been able to uh, start two initiatives, uh, which are very connected with, as I say, with pedagogical models, and they are embedded in the educational system and in which I have uh, created uh, another, I would say, another model of pedag pedagogy, uh, which is, comes in totally, it's fully different and diverse from the frozen education that our, my country is providing to young people. Uh, I just want to say that because of the economic crisis and now because of COVID um, this, uh, and our new government, art is not anymore taught in schools. They thought that art is unnecessary. So the young people, they have no any connection and any means to create, to imagine and um, for e even to, to create something, you know, using their imagination in hand. So I have been doing a lot of this kind of work that right. I can talk later. Thank you. Yeah, we'll come back to that for sure. Uh, Nova. Finding the mute button. Um, I'm Nova Benway. It's nice to see you again, Simon. I feel like we've been meeting a lot this way yeah, recently. Stop meeting like this. <laughs> um, but I'm the director of uh, Triangle Arts Association um, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and we are part of a, the International Triangle Network, started in 1982. Um, and we started as a two week summer intensive residency and about 20 years ago, we transitioned to offering year round residencies for local and also many international artists um, for, for three months. 
Great. Do you want to give us a sense of where the network uh, is based across the world? Yeah, I mean, Triangle is primarily, um, in a funny way, I'm, I'm the wrong ambassador for it because it was primarily initiated as a way of connecting um, uh, organizations that were not considered in the popular imagination to be part of the, the uh, uh, of, of art centers. Um, so there's a number of them in Africa, Asia. Um, we're the only one in the United States. Um, and uh, the hub of the network is in, in London, but uh, we're kind of really the, the only two, I think. Well, you know, of course there's, you know, art has become increasingly decentralized, but that was part of Triangle's original mission in, in, the, in the early eighties. And it was initiated by uh, artists as far as I understand. Yes, uh, the sculptor Anthony Caro, British sculptor, um, as well as as a number of others, and and there have been um, uh, members of the network that participated in New York and went back to their home countries and started um, other members of the network, Triangle Network, sort of organically in that way through participation. Great, thank you, uh, Virginie. If you can uh, unmute, ah yes, yes. So I'm Virginie, hello, I'm French, but I've been living in Congo for the last almost 20 years, um, Democratic Republic of Congo. So I'm co-running Studios Kabako, which uh, is an old art organization founded in 2001. So it will be 20 years next year uh, by Faustin Linekula, uh, who is a choreographer and stage director. Um, first, it was founded in Kinshasa, because at that time when Faustin, Faustin uh, spent a few years outside the country, when he came back, the country was at war, so he couldn't come back to his uh, home city, which is Kisangani, so it, because Kisangani was in the rebel zone, so it settled in Kinshasa and started Studio Skabako, which was a kind of a research space, mental space, because it didn't have any space at that time, but more space, uh, a sharing space for research, for production and creation for performing arts. And in 2006, seven, we decided to go back to Kisangani, so his, his home city. Um, and there we opened up to new fields. So we're gonna open up to music because at that time the music scene in Kisangani was really vivid. So we say we have to do something with a bit like organically with these young people and also to, to film and cinema. Um, and, um, and also the question at that time was how to have a, an impact at the scale of the city. So it was really important to also imagine our uh, action um, inside the city and not only in the city center, but in, in the different areas of the city. Um, and, um, and we started doing a lot of things uh, using the city kind of the stage. There is no theater in the city, but you can use a lot of space to do things. So we did a lot of things in different areas. And especially since 2013, we are a lot working on a specific district, which is the district of Lubunga. Um, it's uh, about, uh, Kisang it's a 1 million, 1.2 million city. So it's not a village. Lubunga, it's about 250,000 people living there. Uh, but it's the only uh, neighborhood which is um, separated from the rest of the city by the Congo River, and there are no, no bridges, so there's a kind of mentally and socially and in many ways isolated from the rest of the city. And we are developing a lot of things around, um, it's about, most of it, it's about how to take care of your community, how to take care of your local environment. Uh, doing and developing projects with people, mainly with young people and kids around cinema, but also around the environmental issues and sustainable issues like, uh, like drinking water, like also deforestation. Right now we are working a lot around forests. Great, thank you. Uh, Elena? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, very nice to be part of this event. Um, I'm from Moscow, uh, Russia, and uh, I've been working since 2001 um, for independent organization CEH, uh, which primarily works in contemporary dance. 
it moved through different phases. At the moment, the um, organization is uh, basically several studios with um, uh, studio facilities with, uh, and we give classes for independent, um, we give, sorry, space for independent artists sometimes to rehearse, plus these independent artists teach the amateur people. And also we have a kids uh, group, groups, uh, kids group that um, uh, take dance as a serious subject. So they um, come like three, four days a, uh, a week to study contemporary dance. But parallelly since 2012, I've been working uh, as a director and artistic director for the state company called Theater Belly Moscow. And uh, for me, it's a very interesting experience to sit uh, on both chairs in the independent scene and also in the state scene, which is very different, of course, scenes. And uh, it's like a wall between these scenes still in, in Russia and in Moscow. Um, and recently, uh, I think the crisis in, of course, in Russia also, we have crisis. Uh, pushed a lot of um, people. Uh, I think this is the time of new leadership, really. I think it's really... Um, um, the thing is that finally, uh, recently, the dialogue between independent scene and um, pol politicians started. I think this kind of crisis, it's a good basis that the politicians at the moment, they have no right to say no to the conversations. Um, so there are several initiatives like uh, at the moment, for example, um, in Moscow, it's, it's in Moscow, but it's a virtual um, Congress of the first Congress of Contemporary Dance Artists, Independent Artists. Dina Hussein, one of the artists who lives in France and in Russia, initiated it. And um, I'm part of these discussions. So there is a new network um, building at the moment. Um, another initiative is um, from independent theater groups, uh, very also uh, active and they speak with the Ministry of Culture and with the, um, our politicians about new laws that will financially support uh, independent artists like in France or Belgium. So hopefully uh, next year, maybe the new law will be uh, that if you are independent artist and if you work uh, not in the black market, if you pay taxes uh, and if you really show the papers that you are uh, your practitioner, art practitioner, that at the end of the financial year, you can get a kind of a subsidy, which is equal to the minimum salary um, uh, for 12 months. So it's, I cal calculated it's about $4,000 will be, but I mean, at least it's a good start. So yes, so I am navigating between state and independent scene. And of course, I'm very, um, at the moment, I'm very uh, busy with the, with, the, with the theater because it's a big uh, company, but um, I still engaged a lot in um, independent scene and in different initiatives. So this is what I do now. Elena, thank you. Now, it would be good to talk about those structural changes uh, later. Uh, so let's finish the introductions. Uh, Selma. Uh, hello, hi everyone. Uh, so um, yes, I'm, I'm an artist and activist based in Zagreb, which is the capital, today's capital, I um, mean, the capital of today's Croatia. Um, yeah, just shortly, um, I would introduce myself tonight as, as a person uh, that participates in uh, local and transnational solidarity initiatives related to the ongoing feminist, anti-fascist, uh, migrant and worker struggles. And curling, currently, um, those initiatives are um, trans, uh, Trans-Balkan Solidarity, and for bread, uh, cultural workers raising up for wages, which both uh, in a way started uh, simultaneously um, in relation to uh, the pandemic. Great. That's it for now. Yeah. So the, um, 
The other person who is going to join us uh, is Nora Murad, who's based in uh, Damascus in Syria. Uh, she's having major problems with the, uh, the electricity supply. There's been lots of cuts in Damascus this week. So in lieu of being with us, she sent me um, overnight uh, a short video, which is responding more to my questions than introdu introducing herself. But I thought if we uh, see this four minute uh, video from Nora, it will give us a sense of her perspective on many of the issues we're about to discuss. So Thea, I don't know if we can play the video. I know the sound is a bit quiet. Um, of but course. But Thea can share the screen and we can see Nora Murad. Hello everyone. Thank you, Simon, for inviting me to be with all of you today. I'm Nora Murad. I'm an actress, choreographer, the artistic director of Les Troupe, a physical theater company. I live and work in Damascus. I believe that Simon is posing very hard but necessary questions. It seems we are stuck with the virtual world. And I use the word stuck because technology is absolutely useful for exchanging information and ideas, for speeding transactions, for resourcing and finding people, but it is terrible for real human interaction. I believe that nothing will replace the life human contact we need to create and to present our work. And I don't think that replacement solutions are the best strategy here. We need to look to the root of the issue and create strategy based on fundamental questions about artistic forms we can create according to the changes in the reality we use to deal with in our everyday life and in our work questions about our relation with the audience who are losing their faith in words like hope or concepts like free will and choice. The most important step is to accept the change and to stop resisting it. Because the essential matter in change is that things don't get back as it used to be. So solidarity, support and patience, patience is essential. Getting out of rushing solutions and taking a pause to be more and more aware of what we are proposing for the present that will, that will affect the future of our career and of our role in our societies. And the danger of abandoning objective reality towards complete dependence on virtual reality. We need to learn more about each other's experiences, ideas and challenges to be able to create an artistic collective voice who can participate in change beyond just adaptation. Technology, of course, can help, can help us uh, to achieve this, but not in the way I see online. Do you remember how much disconnected you feel when you watch a live performance on a screen? <clears throat> and how much the performance itself loses emotional and static quality and interaction uh, between the performers and the audience? If collaborative creations are limited by internet for now, maybe we can shift our focus on artistic research by gathering different individuals in art and culture, thinkers, strategy planners, and give them online platform to exchange ideas and brainstorming. We need to open up towards seeing the upcoming upcoming possibilities, so it is necessary to create collaboration and conversations between artists and experts in humanities, social science, philosophy, economics, and technology. And at in the same time, we need to find solutions to continue to present live performances even to a small amount of people. As artists, we need to support each other and start to think and to plan as a global group. I know that funding is not an issue to discuss here, but I know too that in order to participate in real change, we need to encourage the independent funds to achieve real independency from institutions led by ideologies that does not place art and culture as a priority and insist to resisting change or denying it, or at the very least, wait until, until it ends so that everything gets back as it used to be.
Thank you. So Nora raises many uh, issues there that I'm sure we will come back to. But i imploring us to embrace this moment to recognize change needs to happen and that we should not resist uh, the possibilities that that offers us. So really, this is a question for all of you. Um, and we can go certainly in a different sequence. But the question is to do with very much this year, since, uh, since February of this year, how has the public health crisis, the economic crisis, the growing political crises impacted your work and the work of the artists you work with. I'm, I'm really keen that we get a sense of, of how artists are being impacted and what strategies you're having to develop in order to support or sustain your work and the artists you work with. So can we start with, um, maybe we start with Susan, given um, the Art Prospect Festival has just happened and you've been very uh, busy working with your network uh, across Central Asia and Caucasus. Um, yes, thank you, Simon. Um, I would say that we, we developed can a number... Oh, can you hear me okay? Um, you know, when everything started and, you know, CC Arts and what we do is in-person exchange. So for us, it was a complete shock to have it just come immediately to a halt. And we started off, of course, like probably everyone, just talking to people who are supposed to participate in our programs, our partners, and developed a whole a number of different ways of working with people. Um, for the artists who were supposed to come to our residency program, we decided that we didn't want to do virtual residencies, but what would be most helpful would be have to have monthly meetings with them where we could introduce them to the arts community in St. Petersburg and talk about common issues. Um, for our network partners, we um, were very fortunate to be able to find, to receive a grant, which enabled us to redistribute funds to them to help artists in their communities. And for us, it was most important to be able to address um, the issues that our partners felt were most important in their countries, because each country is going through very different problems right now. Um, in St. Petersburg, we decided that the most effective way for us to use the resources was through our festival, um, Art Prospect, which is a public art festival. And of course, it doesn't seem like a very easy thing to do to make public art online. And what we decided to do was to create an online offline festival where we had an open competition for artists from um, the, all over the world, but mostly United States and post-Soviet countries to submit um, proposals for projects that were interventions in their own personal space as a way for them to share what was going on in their lives and for the, to give them an opportunity to engage their local community. So artists created um, projects on their balconies and their windows and local parks. Um, and then we created a website and an app um, that was only available, unfortunately, in Russian, where people could see these projects all over the world. And we also um, created um, different ways to communicate with the artists participating in the programs through um, live interviews on Instagram, through a number of seminars. Um, I think one of the most um, effective ways of actually working with the artists was a party that we had on Zoom with the participants, which was very interactive and really brought the group together. Um, what we heard from the participants was how important this festival was for them, that everyone had been feeling very isolated, that there was no way for them to share their work. And this really provided a unique way for them to share their work, both with their local community and talk to their neighbors, you know, from a safe distance, but also then to talk to artists in other countries who were doing similar things. Um, and for me, this was really one of the most effective ways that we've been able to work online. And it's also something that I think we want to do in the future, because now we see that um, we can work with people all over the world in a new way and really bring people together virtually um, and at the same time in person. Of course, we're very much looking forward to returning to in-person meeting, um, but we also now are starting to see the value 
um, of these online communications. And a couple of questions that I'm just gonna put out there for everyone. Um, things that we've been struggling with is that when you're trying to do something like a public art festival, how do you reach out to new audiences through social media? And that has been a real challenge for us. And um, we also feel that we do not have the skills to um, create new audiences and promote ourselves well enough on social media. So I'd be really curious to hear what ideas people might have to um, improve that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Virginie, welcome back. I'm wondering if you would like to talk a little bit about um, your response to the uh, the pandemic, I mean, not just in terms of your work, but then how you started to reach out to colleagues across the African continent. Okay. Um, yes, I think we were when everything happened and when everything was cancelled. We were first in London, then we we came back to Lisbon, and. Um, and we start thinking about because uh, first I had a lot of uh, requests from journalists from um, different websites to uh, do some intervention around uh, what the situation was in over the continent for young artists and each time you say no I don't want to answer first because I'm not right now on the continent and second because I just need to digest everything I'm not yeah I'm not in a mood to share for the moment um, and then I just realized that it was a kind of a the easy way uh, because to to for journalists or for this organization to to try to know how things were happening on the continent, they were just uh, reaching the most famous and uh, established choreographers. And but but the point is not there. Of course, the point is about the young artists, the the, the next generation first, because it's not. For some, of course, it's, it's important in the landscape, but but it's not him we will make the future of dance. It's uh, this young uh, artists that are now in between 20 and 30s. Most of them, I'm, I'm not sure they will survive or go through this. So if they give up right now what they are doing, of course, it will impact the dance scene in 10 or 20 years. Um, and, and I had this idea that maybe we should try to reach them and to commission them a kind of letter, I was imagining that as a letter, um, for them to share where, where they were, how they were going through all of this in their different cities, in their different contexts. Um, and so we, we, we reached about 21 artists, first time uh, had a discussion with each of them. And, and then at the same time, I, I, I contacted a lot of partners, close partners, theater organization, asking if they had a bit of money. So it was just, if they had like 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 dollars um, left and had a huge, very quick response. So we, in fact, over three weeks, we raised more than the double that we were expecting, we are thinking. And so we could offer to each of them uh, a fees to, um, to design a, a video letter um, and out of this 21 um, letters that are a bit like uh, kind of auto portrait of, of these artists. So it's all over the continents. There are artists from Tunisia, from, um, uh, from Morocco, uh, from Madagascar, from Comor, from Mali, uh, Senegal, uh, uh, South Africa, Congo, of course, Gabon. Uh, Mozambique, Tanzania, uh, so it's a lot more than 18 countries. Um, and we made out of that a film, uh, which is called Letters from the Continent, that, that had just been released. Uh, we just had a screening this afternoon in Kinshasa, the film, so it, it was really well received. And, and um, yes, it, it's a, it was a kind of a response. So he had to be very quick, we wanted it to be very, so we started the shoot that in a in May, June, uh, and uh, we edited it in July, and the film was ready end of September. So it was kind of very short emergency response to that. And also to show our solidarity with, with this young generation, because us, it's very difficult right now, but we'll, we'll, we'll go through that, we will survive because we have networks, we have been there for quite a long time now. But for them, it's really, really difficult. All the more that the circulation, oh, it's almost impossible. So, yes. <laughs> you.
Simon, I think you're muted. I can't unmute. No, I've done it. Sorry, just to say Lettre du Continent, the film, the letters from the continent that Virginie is streaming on our website at midnight on Saturday. So you have two more nights to, uh, to see it. Um, Jenny, in terms of uh, your work and the projects that you've been doing and the organizations you're connecting with in, uh, in Athens, yeah. Can you give us a sense of the impact this year and, and how people are coping? Okay. Um, for me it has been, of course, like everybody um, with COVID, I was in uh, New York. Um, and definitely we all had to reinvent uh, the way we work, the way we communicate. But for me, what I realized that a lot of the problems that we have been talking, especially because my work is very physically based and I have to go out of the studio and work with people and meet with people and communities that became impossible. Also another issue is the travel. So it's very difficult to travel as I used to travel back and forth from New York to Athens. And what is a pity, I was able in the last three years and not and with not Greek, not with governmental funding or public funding, but with the support of private funding to create those two platforms and, and creating a collective with teachers from 18 schools that they are from underprivileged uh, communities in Athens, and especially with communities that they uh, engage with refugee uh, kids and refugees, uh, youth, I would say. And, and we were, and I was able with the support of the, 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 the teachers community to embed our project, not after school, it became part of the regular program and it was a very interesting process because it was an idea which was based on, on, on the model that the students themselves, which are vary from 14 to 19 years old, they create not only their own education, but they create their own syllabus. And I facilitate the, and bring together the people that they want to facilitate their ideas and their projects. And this became a part of the regular syllabus without going through the minister, Ministry of Education. And we did incredible projects that they have been also, one of these was part of the School of Everything for Documenta in the Parliament of Body that Paul Preciado curated, but also it was a very, uh, it brought a lot of energy and a lot of, of um, activity in those schools that they don't even have a play yard. And the way it, they were organized with the, we were, we were organizing assemblies like this, that all schools were coming together during the weekend. And the, I was, and the good Institute supported a lot of this project. And we were able to give also the students and the, the youth the opportunity to get together, to learn how to gather to, together, how to exchange ideas, how to, to, um, uh, to uh, actually even to learn how to, uh, to protest, how to speak freely, how so the, the structure of the assembly was a very main, characteristic of this uh, kind of uh, um, uh, project that we have started and still goes on. Unfortunately, I will go back to the, the issues of COVID. One thing that we realized, although everybody says connectivity, interactivity, we are all connected. I'm, I'm very sorry to say the technology is not accessible to everybody. 
and especially in schools and young people and especially in communities, they don't even have internet. So you run to the issue, a big issue, which is not only a Greek issue, I think is a, a, a universal issue right now that we find out that many people don't, many, many young people, many, many families do, cannot even, you know, connect. So it has, I, I have been unable to find a way that I can engage all this huge community of youth together online. But we are working remotely because, as I say, it's not easy for me to go back and forth to Greece, although I can go to Greece because I also have an Greek ID, so I am allowed to go to Greece because Americans are not allowed to go to Greece yet. Um, uh, I, I'm, uh, we, we are doing an hyper, what I call hypertext ebook. So we work, it's partially, you know, um, I would say I, I work with part of, of these young people because everybody doesn't have access. And we are putting together kind of an ebook. So we are creating an archive right now of what we did, what we are doing. And hopefully I can, I'm planning to go back uh, sometime in February and I hope things are better and we can get back into our physical actions and interactions. So right now we are all in a, in a huge uncertainty, suffering from <laughs> and not good connections. <laughs> I think the, the, the issue of technology is, is a great, because I teach also, I'm a, I, I teach new media and socially engaged art at the new school. So I must say that technology is amazing, is incredible what we can do but it is very, still very exclusive. So this is my as situation North. as far as this part of my work. I'm doing my work. I have my studio here in New York. I have a studio in Dumbo. I teach a new school. I do my films. You know, I continue my practice, but it is a very lonely, isolated practice right now. Yeah as many people are facing. Yes. So um, RT East, uh, Gulnara and Murat Beck, uh, how has the impact been for you? Um, thank you, Jenny. Uh, thank you, um, Nora, for interesting uh, um, explanation. explanation. And uh, it's uh, where I think um, we have very intersections with the uh, Jenny, uh, Jenny activities because we also uh, did a lot of workshops with our students in our art school for contemporary art. It was like a horizontal platform uh, of interaction with uh, young students and young artists. And uh, we can say that this year, it, this uh, uh, our school transformed into a new platform of uh, with uh, which united uh, several uh, institutions in Bishkek, and I we are very happy that it's it's going on. Uh, and um, we also work at uh, with uh, school children and in, uh, in the villages, so we have this kind of experience too. So we understand uh, Jenny, uh, your situation. <laughs> And of course, we also totally agree with Nora about that. It's, it's uh, sometimes it's um, it's impossible to do something virtually. It's you need to you need to uh, meet some people uh, uh, and interact uh, physically and so on. But uh, I can say some maybe uh, different stuff right now because um, of course we uh, have a new situation when we have very limited mobility possibilities, especially international mobility possibilities. But we don't uh, think that it was completely unpredictable or something very new for, for our uh, for, for all society because most of the population have already uh, used social network uh, like Facebook or Instagram and many others. 
and connect with each with each other by Skype uh, or uh, WhatsApp. And uh, the only new things is now is Zoom, and unfortunately, you uh, should pay for this. Uh, and um, as eco activists. Uh, uh, we think that this situation of lockdown and mobility limitation is even much better than for, for planet. Of course, we have less possibilities to meet in person and drink together. Uh, but it seems online party is getting popular now. And just recently we had this kind of party with international artists. It's like a joke. But uh, this year we have very nice experience with the uh, arts link when arts link gave us a uh, possibility to support artists in kyrgyzstan uh, it was something like uh, small grants uh, and we divided this budget among 30 artists according to their applications and uh, the new situation of isolation uh, made artists to slow down their activity it gave some time for uh, rethinking and to begin archiving or to create their own book or web page. Artists also do some performances at home. And uh, probably you know that uh, uh, during isolation, a lot of, uh, well, it was a lot of restriction for school children. And uh, many artists, designers and architects uh, who have their own children at home try to collaborate with each other. And uh, in order to gather their children together and make some workshops and small exhibitions. Uh, and we try to also to support this kind of activities. Uh, we, re we realize that uh, this system of uh, small grants uh, from ArtsLink, for example, it's very convenient. Uh, very artist has his or her own agenda and plans. So they are not dependent from certain curatorial projects or art events from different institutions. And so this is very flexible and effective way of supporting artists. Uh, this is very short explanation what we're doing. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we'll come back though, because I, I think in a sense, uh, what you're talking about is a kind of emergency intervention. I'm, I'm curious how you see that evolving and developing going forward. But, but let's, uh, let's finish this round of looking at current impact. Uh, Nova, could you share with us how it's impacted your residency program and the artists you're working with? Yeah, I mean, I would just echo and reiterate a lot of what has already been said. I mean, um, we had a, a group of artists who arrived in New York on March 1st, one from Hong Kong, one from Taipei, um, one from Delhi, um, and one from Toronto, which is a little bit closer, but still all of them, you know, um, uh, without U.S. passports and uh, uh, you know, arriving the first week of March in a sort of, well, let's, let's see what happens. But, you know, um, un it's unbelievable to say, but uh, there was no sense that a lockdown was coming. So everyone sort of arrived. I mean, we all were completely uh, blinded to the, this immediate possibility. And then it seemed that overnight, um, it was just clear that everyone had to leave. So um, we spent, as Susan was saying, we spent a few weeks, you know, just coordinating um, people getting on flights and, and being able to leave. But uh, we've spent the last months since then, um, we reopened actually in, in September. So we do have artists in the studios now, but they are all um, local. So we have not yet had a, another, you know, obviously another international resident, which is really a huge change for us. Um, but uh, the months between March and September, um, I really agree with, with what many have said, what, what Nora said, that it was very important for us not to pretend uh, that we could continue as usual or to try, you know, I feel like I saw a lot of organizations um, 
really ramp up their um, digital content, uh, virtual, you know, events and, and suddenly residencies were doing performances and talks and all kinds of things online, which I, I completely understand it in some ways because people were hungry for connection. But it seemed very important to me to uh, allow all of us, all of our artists that we work with and ourselves as, as staff and you know members of our organization to um, process what was happening. Um, and so we spent a lot of time actually um, outside of the public eye meeting with artists on Zoom and occasionally in person, you know, when we could meet outside when the weather was nice, but uh, just just talking with people. And uh, it's very simple to say, but I think that is the foundation of everything that we do. Um, I also think, um, you know, Jenny, it was very interesting to hear you talk about being in New York and, you know, I'm, I'm here in, in the middle of Brooklyn and uh, I'm here on Zoom with all of you and you're in all these different parts of the world and there's a, a shelter for unhoused people five, five minutes walk from my house where it's been the center of a kind of controversy around um, uh, education and the you know possibilities for um, in-person versus uh, online-based education in the New York City public school system. And there are many, many kids, thousands of kids who have no access and this is something that I think in, in a city like New York, which is so wealthy, you know, it's it's a problem all over the world, but it's it's a particular kind of problem here where people don't even necessarily realize that this is a problem. So we're 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 confronting those issues even with, you know, this is a context that even our local artists are are kind of surrounded by. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think like many, I I don't have a, I don't have answers except that uh, these, these connections, these human connections are so much more important now. And I'm sorry I'm you know, going on, but I, I just wanna uh, also highlight the work that CEC is doing. Um, I don't know if everyone knows Simon, you know, should I say something about like our experience with Anne Miriam Baikla who's in Estonia? Should I, or have you already sort of talked about that structure? It sounds like a, a bit of self-promotion, but um, if, if, if it's relevant to the discussion, uh, it's fine. Well, maybe I'll say it so it's not a self-promotion for you. <laughs> um, but it's, it's one example of, um, so I, and I think she's actually on this, on this call, and, and Miriam Baikla, who's a, a curator and, and cultural producer in Estonia, was intended to come in person and be with us in New York this, this year at this time. And of course, that's not possible. And so with the support of CEC, we've been um, in conversation with her virtually, laying a foundation for, you know, we all hope and believe that by this time next year, she'll be able to actually come. So I think when you can make those clear connections between the things that happen online out of necessity, and then, you know, the, the, the thing that we all agree that, that if there's no substitute for meeting in person, those things can support each other. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that as a real example. And I'm sorry, Simon, I didn't mean to, <laughs> to, to create an advertisement, but it is, it's really a, been a wonderful thing for us. Great. Well, I'm glad it's a, a, a good way forward. Um, Elena, I know you're working both with independent artists or, and as well as within the, the kind of state system. So yeah. can you give us a, a sense of the impact on those two as you said, very divided uh, areas of practice in, in Moscow. Yeah. So I think to begin with that uh, the lockdown happened in Russia later. I mean, actually not in each city the lockdown happened. Russia is very huge territory, as you know. So in Moscow, it happened from the middle of March. And of course, we, we didn't expect anything like this. So, and we didn't take it seriously. I think in, in our character, sometimes not to, to take things seriously at the beginning. Um, so, and we all were thinking that it's just one month, maximum two months, and um, that, that's it, that will finish and we go on with a normal life. But uh, after a um, couple of weeks, uh, we started to realize that it's a 
middle term long term situation and um, if we speak um, like I will divide my answer in three parts uh, me as a person as a professional um, working for 20 years in performing arts um, for me the lockdown was a sudden uh, proposal from uh, like from universe to to sit at home and think because just generally to ask questions why we do this how we do uh, why we do international work why we do not do so much national work and etc so the lockdown was very interesting for me in terms of zoom out from the day-to-day -day problems and to think about general situation you know in about future and if we speak about state organizations uh, in russia if you are a state organization then you get subsidy from the government from the city government or from the federal government and most of the times it covers the minimum at least minimum salary or the whole salary or the minimum the salary and um, it's interesting that uh, all the artists who are on that salary it turned out it's not enough I mean, the salary is good, of course, but sitting at home for especially artists who get uh, used to meet each other in the studio, like be physically together, be um, um, rehearsing something or be in the process of something. So as a state organization, and the funny thing that um, Department of Culture of Moscow the, the organization that uh, we, we, we uh, support us and to whom we to which we report they even didn't ask us to do anything you know extra like we they were happy that we just you know stopped our <laughs> uh, work and that's it so we explore with the dancers and with our house choreographers a lot of different online things of course online projects we even created uh, an online um, performance that we showed a couple of times really online it was not a recording and uh, we came across with a problem that uh, of course technology is a good thing but we are not capable uh, like we need to learn a new uh, new technologies in deep we cannot just you know in five minutes throw the new show with the new technologies we really need to have time to get acquainted with this technology and how the audience will react to this technology. So, but if we speak about the independent scene, uh, the result of the uh, first um, half of the pandemic, everything that happened before summer and during summer, uh, when everyone realized that it's not, it's not finishing. So uh, suddenly the voices of the independent artists became visible. And this is, I think, a um, very interesting situation because political situation in Russia doesn't allow at the moment, you know, to speak about artistic independent problems, uh, problems of the independent artists. It's a too small problems. But at the moment, because now it's a question of survival of independent people, um, suddenly they, their voices were heard. So as I mentioned before, it's a nice um, initiative. For, there are three initiatives that I can uh, about which I can say that one initiative it's called uh, Artists on Fire. It's a, um, a project on Facebook where um, it's a group, Facebook group, uh, there are a bit less than two thousand uh, participants, and this uh, group started. Um, um, independently first, and then they started to approach the theater union of Russia. It's a big uh, consortium organization to talk to the uh, Ministry of Culture and to the federal government about this uh, a law that uh, independent artist is also a person who pays taxes and that uh, he can have uh, this minimum wage wage uh, when he is busy with his projects. Uh, and another initiative is um, that the new generation of contemporary dance independent artists raised at the moment, raised at the moment, and uh, um, they rethink actually now, at the moment they have a um, congress, online congress, uh, and it's international congress, and they discuss how they um, 
can survive in the future, but also they, they talk about artistic uh, issues. Uh, can they work further without international impact or they need to, you know, to continue the international work and how they will be funded in the future and etc. So, but the, I think the good thing is that um, the leadership changing uh, and it seems that the new networks appearing uh, even formal, informal, sorry, in networks. And um, also another initiative that in Moscow is at the moment, there are a lot of independent small theater groups uh, in opera, in contemporary dance, in theater, in puppets. And uh, suddenly there is initiative from the government, Moscow government, from the agency of um, creative industries. And at the moment, it's a big uh, discussion about finding a, um, place a venue which is um, um, a, like abandoned factory but a factory that belongs to the city and that uh, the government is ready finally to pay um, uh, for these artists for this cluster the um, how do you call it the uh, rent expenses so the outcome of these six months is that uh, the independent theater groups will get the facility where they can share, share office, rehearsal studios, and maybe the uh, storage rooms. And uh, you cannot imagine this discussion one year ago. That was not possible. So suddenly the whole, you know, uh, health situation le led to completely new uh, discussions about artistic life. This is very unusual because these discussions stopped 2012, 2014, 14. So I think last five, six years, we had no hope that there will be some day discussion again about uh, governmental support or about facilities support or about new networks and etc. So it was a last five years were very um, gray years, I would say, because of course of the politics. So suddenly I have good news. <laughs> from uh, our side. But, but I, I'm seeing it as the conversation is no longer, it's not really about art, it's more about uh, how you support citizens. Um, and that changes the nature of a conversation like that. Yeah. But let's go to uh, Selma. I, I was worried you'd disappeared, but you're back, that's good. Yeah, yeah, no, don't worry, I'm here. Um, I am. Yeah, thank you. I'm. I'm. I'm li listening carefully, and um, uh, it's very interesting to hear uh, how. Uh, yeah, we are uh, met with uh, uh, different challenges around the the globe. Um, so maybe I would uh, continue this conversation from a position of uh, myself being uh, a precarious cultural worker. And um, also very honestly, um, with the start of the pandemic or the lockdown in, in March, um, I've, yeah, I personally felt resistance to just adopt to these new circumstances, right? I mean, we, we all saw that this huge amount of cultural artistic production uh, that is being now shifted uh, uh, from different uh, physical spaces uh, to uh, the online, uh, different online platforms. For me, this time was really about, okay, uh, I have to acknowledge or my community, I, with my community, I need to understand what is happening. And, and um, yeah, what, what is happening is that, uh, I mean, the conclusion, uh, it's, I'm still in the process. I think we are all still in process, but that um, this um, public health crisis and the economical crisis, um, uh, in a way, uh, just emphasized uh, the structural problems that we all share as communities in arts and culture, right? So we were precarious before the pandemic, and we uh, are continuing to be even more. Uh, so uh, in the time uh, of the pandemic. So for me, the question is, how do we, um, what, is the, what is now the fight? How, do, how can we imagine this post-pandemic world, right? So uh, for me personally, uh, to go back to how things were before 
is not an option. So for me, I mean, I, I refuse to go back to, you know, uh, practice as usual, like just, you know, kind of uh, continuing to um, be cultural worker and precariously uh, uh, build, um, uh, um, devise artwork, uh, artwork uh, devise, um, um, trans transnational uh, networks or devise um, uh, even 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 uh, um, uh, I mean even yeah even even um, social work in a sense of if we don't rethink the structural uh, issues and if we don't seek structural change uh, I I believe that we will be you know going back to their normal without uh without the fight so um i mean i don't know i believe it's 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 similar in uh, in in majority of the places locations on the, on this planet but most artists and cultural workers live on the edge of poverty and this has been proven in this uh in this uh crisis i mean um we could also see that at least in the reaction of um, Croatian uh, Ministry of Culture or like let's say the um, the governmental body that is kind of should be facilitating um, structurally what is what what ha what had happened in a sense how did this kind of uh, lockdown not only lockdown but also uh, inability to work inability to um, foster um, uh, cultural labor, uh, their response was again, um, it was again uh, served as uh, a, through a market driven uh, cultural policies and, 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 and logic, right? And uh, yeah, uh, for me and, and, and for a lot of the people uh, in my community, uh, locally, but also transnationally, I think now the discussion is really uh, that we need to collectively start thinking how to devise a discourse that, that uh, is not about us adopting our art uh, and social practices to this um, new circumstances, but to understand how we can uh, demand uh, something that we were doing, I mean, uh, for decades. And this is what I'm, I'm hearing from, from a lot of people uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this panel. Uh, of course, I mean, what that could be, I mean, it's, it's for sure saying goodbye and good night forever to capitalism, right? To understand uh, how we can, you know, uh, start demanding, uh, unconditional universal basing income for uh, laborers in, in culture and in arts, how to further devise fair pay protocols, how to uh, seek uh, uh, um, or like push even further public funding, especially where those, I mean, public funding does not exist or is in a way being shifted from the logic of the, uh, the public good or the commons to uh, the private sector and uh, uh, sponsorship, right? Or, um, you know, how we can ourselves as, as communities uh, start thinking uh, uh, about redistribution of resources, not only locally, but also globally. And I think this is also something that is very much to con connected to the question of, okay, what is, I mean, mobility for us? Uh, uh, in the, not only before, uh, in the pre-pandemic, Times, but also um, in in now we see it very clearly that we were in a way made to be agents of this constructed uh, uh, political uh, discourse, especially in European Union, that said you know through through arts through through artists uh, uh, artists mobility or like art, artists traveling right uh, and also in educational system uh, through this Erasmus pro uh, programs and so on we in a way made uh, made uh, our geographies and 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 and, and the, the regimes that we live in seem uh, open seem uh, free seem accessible uh, of course they are not that and in that sense uh, uh, i also believe that this time is asking is asking us of us or is putting on on the table the question of who do we i mean what are the communities except the community the art and cultural communities that we now feel that uh, uh, we can that we are connected to and i mean what are the struggles uh, um, that 
can be understood as a, as a common struggles of, of different like uh, when you compare uh, our, our, uh, mobility or like uh, uh, artist mobility and, and uh, my, contemporary migration, I mean, there is this huge political hypocrisy and economical hypocrisy that I think the system made us uh, an, ag an agents of, of that false and, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, completely, uh, I mean, yeah, policy that uh, is working against uh, humanity as such. So for me, yeah, the, these are now the questions. Uh, another one is also how we can, as a global community, think of uh, transnational support going for the local struggles, right? How we can, as a transnational community, support each other on a local scale. On a local scale. And I believe that discussions like this are, are a step in that direction, you know, to understand uh, our global community uh, uh, in specific, uh, in a local a specific context, uh, transculturally, of course, but also how, uh, you know, this transnational support uh, can be um, there, uh, can be uh, claimed, can be in the streets, in, in the streets uh, of the local struggles and other way around, right? How specific local struggles can be built into a transnational movement. And all of this I'm saying in the context of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, yeah, an arts and, 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 and cultural, uh, global cultural community. So um, yeah, this is kind of very much in, 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 in uh, briefly how, what, what was happening. Of course, all of my um, artistic engagement were on hold or were kind of postponed. Uh, which I, of course, uh, uh, um, which was in a way a sign of, uh, okay, we need to re rethink. Uh, I really like this call, the, 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 the transnational call of, uh, you know, that there was kind of addressing, um, you know, um, cancel everything, pay everyone, but that didn't happen. That di really didn't happen. What we saw is actually a huge pressure on art production or, or on, on cultural laborers to continue producing. So there is still this argument that what we do as art and cultural communities is worth, uh, is, is worthy, meaning that it should be funded, that it should be publicly funded, that it makes, that it makes sense, that it is a contribution to the society. Uh, I mean, can we imagine and can we imagine a uh, uh, future without uh, um, what we do? I mean, um, so um, now, yeah, yeah, um, shortly, th that's that's kind of uh, my, um, yeah, my, my thoughts around. Um, and another thing, what I what I thought is also interesting, what I what I kind of experienced is that um, you know this precarity of people uh, of the artists and cultural workers is not a byproduct of the system right we all are fundamental to make make that system exist and this is something that we have to have to change before going into the you know discussion of how do i adopt my art practice or my social practice uh, uh, for this kind of difficult times for everyone. Um, of course, technology and, and, and um, is exclusive. I mean, we a lot of people do not have access not to internet, but to like water and electricity, right. So um, other notes on, on the other notes uh, about technology, we also I mean, of course, we use it, we use it daily, not only in our art and social uh, practices, but also in our daily uh, co communication, like which technolo te technology do we use? Like, why do we use Zoom? Why don't we use uh, some open source technologies, right? So in a way also kind of trying to be careful of, uh, uh, about who do we support with our actions and who can support us with, their, with theirs. Great. Soma, you laid out a lot of the issues too. Um, we have 15 minutes left, so I'm keen we're also looking at how we're moving forward. Can I say Today I'll get to you in a second. There, there's a, clearly a lot of issues around how we connect with each other. And I think this, this conversation about working locally, uh, but also having uh, a way of connecting transnationally is a, a really important one. 
but uh, uh, yeah, let's go to Jenny first and then have a more open discussion. There are a few questions too that relate to this. So uh, we'll I, 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 I will be very short. I agree for, to, fully with what Selma said, because me uh, working and living in Greece and in US, especially in Greece, I am fully aware of the precarity of the artistic labor, which is the same also in the US. Uh, just in the US, we have more resources and we have the illusion that we it's possible to do more things. But one question, what, as I have been thinking about my responsibility and what can I offer in this situation of uh, how can I do something as a citizen, I also find that, yes, I agree, we artists perpetuate and we accept being pre precarious workers. But also, I have to put a lot of responsibility to the institution. And because we as artists, and I think uh, the art has the power to bring us together and, and create those uh, trans transnational connections and uh, communities, but I also think it's time to put a lot of pressure on the institutions. It's not us that we have to change, it's the institutions, the foundations, the organizations that they have to change to support our work and support not certain artists or certain uh, works or certain movements, I would say, or especially in the art world. Um, it, they should be open so that the museums, they change the way they function. They, they create tools, they create uh, possibilities for diverse groups and communities and artists to come together and support these works and, and, and support the, the, this kind of, that we look for togetherness, which is not just giving us a space, but it gives us all the support to realize what we can imagine by practicing with communities, with individuals, taking in consideration senior, senior citizens, taking in consideration youth, taking, taking in consideration the disabled. I can go on, but the institution don't care. So to my opinion, it not, it's not just our, us, the artists, but it is also, I put a lot of responsibility also into the institutions and organization to create this kind of in, 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 interdisciplinary and uh, transnational connections. And I agree, we have to work locally and be able also to work internationally. We need both at the moment. And I think Nora touched on it too, saying that uh, as artists, we need to think together and uh, act together as a yeah. global group, not just rely on individual actions in individual places. Right. But, um, but Virginie, can I come back to you? Because in your email to me, you were very clear about this uh, paradox in the African continent between you know, the desire to connect and work locally, but the need to still have uh, international and transnational uh, support and production, but also performance opportunities. That's how the economy works. And you'd need to have a completely different kind of uh, relationship to the cultural economy if you're really going to work uh, locally. <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, for us, we don't have any organization or institutions, so that's, <laughs> that's only up to us. And most of organization based in over in Africa have been funded by artists that decided because they were nothing to build their own infrastructure. In Congo, we, we are kidding, saying if you buy a car, you have to build the road. That is exactly that. So, um, but I think, yes, I mean, it's a, it's a big question because for example, if we take the, the example in Africa, because I, I don't want to generalize, but about the choreographic, about contemporary dance, for example, contemporary dance has really been uh, funded by, by the West, by Europe mainly over the continent, but as an export product. So it was something that could be a bit, created over the continent with some residences, but then 
going to serious residences in Europe and to be shown um, for a, a Western audience. Now the question is, um, there were almost no investments for uh, the products, if we say that dance or art is a product to stay and to be shared with local people. And that's a paradox because for example, for health or education, a um, lot of international organizations are, are paying this, um, uh, all this structure and education of teachers, of uh, researchers, but to stay. Uh, but for the artists, they are paid to, to tour outside. So it's a, it's a strange thing because it's, it's very difficult to, to find money for um, projects that are only um, made for local audience or for only for uh, a local context. It's more easy, uh, of course, to, uh, to find money for products or for pieces or that will be shown outside. And that's a paradox because now the question for us is really how to, um, to tell our own stories, but to share the stories with our communities. And that's, that's quite difficult. And in fact, it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a strange transition because we are relying for the moment, all our projects were funded through co-production and touring outside, so mainly in Europe. Did we lose uh, Virginie? Virginie, you're frozen. Ah, she's gone. Um, so Gulnar and Muradbek, you started talking about how you were able to connect with artists uh, in your network. Have you thought about how you can sustain that? How, how are you gonna work to support artists, but also uh, connect them then to a broader community? Um. As was said that uh, uh, this year, our um, former students, they launch uh, a new Bishkek. It's a new platform uh, connected to several institutions like uh, our institution, Artist and uh, Lab Laboratory C and uh, uh, 705 and Studio Museum, uh, which, and they call this Bishkek School. And um, I think it's very interesting that uh, during this uh, isolation and during lockdown, uh, local community of artists try to mobilize. Uh, they try to help each other, and it's uh, it's very interesting effect because uh, 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 it's very hard to uh, well, hard to explain. But maybe you you can understand that being being in isolation for many artists and. Uh, Precarian uh, who work alone and uh, have no any governmental support and have only limited support from maybe international funds. They <clears throat> they they uh, realize that uh, they need to do something together, and it, it was very uh, I think very good decision that uh, all these local uh, institution uh, led by 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 the way by the artists mostly. Uh, artists and architects, they try to uh, engage and uh, they try to make this kind of program for, for the next month, uh, including some workshops and uh, uh, online conversation with international artists uh, and uh, making some uh, intervention actions and respond to some political uh, situation in Bishkek, in, in Kyrgyzstan, because uh, we can explain that this year was really hard to, to Kyrgyzstan because first of all, it was quite challenged with the lockdown. And then uh, in October, we have uh, elections uh, and it was quite, it was, uh, it was, this election was canceled because a lot of riots and uh, people, uh, they, uh, yeah, it was it was completely disagree with uh, with uh, with the um, results of this election was really dirty elections, and uh, it, now it's new president. Uh, I mean, he's temporary president for for two months now, 
and uh, it will be next uh, it will be the next election in january so we have uh, a lot of deals with uh, we have a lot of uh, trials with also feminist uh, feminist uh, uh, movement in in kyrgyzstan and we have a lot of uh, 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 ecological issues, of course, and a lot of actions against the city pollution, air pollution, and, uh, and so on. So it was uh, quite uh, active and uh, quite uh, um, intensive, uh, despite of the situation, but quite intensive, intensive year. And uh, uh, we try to respond uh, to this uh, situation in different, uh, with different. Uh, uh, and in different ways uh, with uh, uh, coming to these actions, to participate with, to, in these actions and to support uh, our students and uh, uh, to support these feminist actions against uh, domestic violence and, um, just, and, and many other stuff. So it's, uh, it's in short, this, this kind of situation. Okay. Um, and Nova, again, in your email, you said, um, how are people planning for the future? And we know the future still includes the pandemic because we're a long way from being post-pandemic. But uh, in terms of your work and your networks, what is being put in place uh, to imagine how we can connect more, act much more locally, uh, and perhaps operate in a way that addresses some of the climate uh, issues around extensive travel and, and that kind of movement. Are, you, are these issues that Triangle is dealing with now? Sure, and I, I mean, I, I think it's a, that's a kind of, in some ways, an intractable issue, the, the question of the climate impact of travel versus the inarguable benefit of, of being together in person. Um, we've also been thinking for a long time, actually for several years um, before the pandemic about the relationship between lo our local um, residencies and our international residencies. Um, you know, New York is is for better or worse, and probably mostly for worse, the kind of place that people will, you know, still want to come to. I mean, that's been an interesting thing for us, and that uh, in, in terms of the international partnerships that we've had, all of the artists, you know, I mentioned before, the artists who all had to sort of unceremoniously pack up very quickly and leave in March. I mean, all of them want to come back as soon as it's safe. I mean, they're thinking about safety, but uh, but they all, you know, New York is such a such a kind of almost a mythological place in so many people's minds. And there are, you know, I shouldn't say it's only a myth. There are real opportunities here um, for artists. Um, but we're thinking also about the artists we serve more and more who already live here. Um, and it's a city that's so expensive to live in. And, and there's so many artists here now who um, have lived here for years without studios, um, whose work is severely curtailed by the fact that they don't have space. Um, and there's really, you know, we've seen a lot of projects that, you know, I mean, uh, everyone on this call, I'm sure knows, that depending on where you're situated and what kind of resources you have and what kind of space you have to work in, you can, you can change the way that you work. So we've been thinking about, about that balance. I mean, coming back to, the question of working with partners like CEC, it's it's increasingly important to me to to really work together. I mean, I think this this very conversation and the conversation that we were part of yesterday, which included the hosts of you know various partnerships that CEC has initiated and 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 the artists who are who are um, involved in those. Um, it's sort of formalizing and highlighting conversations that have been happening, of course, behind the scenes for a long time, but now it's sort of putting a really attenuated sort of finer point on, on why these partnerships are so important. And I think being able to ask, you know, how are the artists uh, sort of funneled through these systems so that uh, we can build a more equitable um, uh, 
way of 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 serving you know a greater sort of more inclusive art community i mean i agree with everything that 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 selma said and many others that um it's a co completely structural problem I mean, it's embedded into massive economic structures and systems and political systems and, and so for us we're i feel that we are you know we're very small residency we host you know a, a handful of artists a year um but uh just by virtue of the work that we do we're connected to all of these different things so it's been very um you know it's given me a lot of perspective to to think both about the individual relationships that we cultivate and just checking in with artists and having one-on-one -on -one conversations but then also kind of seeing you know of course we always knew it was there but seeing these structures much more clearly um one thing that we didn't talk about is again here in new york and i know it's hap happening everywhere the, the relationship between covid and the and the um protests around you know for us at the forefront has been racial justice, but also, you know, things connecting to police violence and, and all of these sort of social issues, which are so strongly connected to the health crisis. Um, and so seeing that, seeing those connections again, you know, I think we always knew they were there, but having them come so clearly, uh, yeah, has had a huge effect. Great. Um, I should say we're really uh, more than over time already. Um, there's a few interesting uh, comments that I feel you should be aware of in the Q&A if you've not opened it. I don't think we need to answer them, but there's some great uh, examples of um, actually uh, ArtsLink uh, alums talking about uh, their experiences, but Les joins talking about um, isolation giving rise to new opportunities and new forms. Uh, and there's Jan, uh, Jan Hanvik's comments about working in an indigenous community in in Mexico, where it's really uh, completely outside a capitalist system, uh, a system of mutual support, where there's very little money, but there's also very little COVID and there's no unemployment. So some great uh, examples to look at. Um, just then to to end in, to, in, in one word or one sentence where what do you think we need to be starting to look at to address how we move forward is it is it uh is it communication is it working locally is it is it connecting globally what's your what's your summary notion of how we should be starting to think about how we move forward and don't all jump in at once <laughs> i can start <laughs> yeah. I, I think <clears throat> I forgot to say that uh, for many Russian artists, it was always important and it was like a measurement of success to be abroad, to go abroad. And uh, we thought that resources are there, the connections are there, and of course they are there. But I think now, even Moscow is such a huge city that it's a nice time to reacquaint with each other and uh, reacquaint between the generations, because now we have several generations of contemporary artists, uh, of administrators, and also reacquaint the state and uh, independent art sector. And I think if we uh, have some time locally, I think we can propose new things globally. Like we really, need this work doing work on with ourselves like work in progress right so i think um it's a nice time elena it was supposed to be one sentence but uh, your small paragraph is allowed thank you <laughs> anyone else before we uh, wrap up jenny you're muted um, what i want to propose that i think we should be more relational because we live so much on online right now, we should be more relational with our local environment, what it happens. But also, as I say, the Anthropocene is very, very anthropocentric. So we should think about the Anthropocene and including us human, humans with all the species. So we should take care of our local 
but also about our un environment. That's that's what is right. very important. So we can work globally and together. Together for sure. Anyone else? We really need to end. We're only uh, five minutes over, but thank yeah, you. No, just to, sorry, Simon. Just, I think the two words that are very important for me, it's to take care and, and, uh, and of your local community. It's not about saving the planet, but saving what's around you. Could be your garden, could be uh, your community, your village, whatever, but to, and then of course, to share uh, and to learn from other experience around that, yes. Save your micro planet, and that will help save the, the big. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say uh, one sentence. Um, I'm very thankful for this conversation, and I believe I know that there is a, a future, a sustainable future for everyone, and art and culture uh, will take part in building that future. So, great. Thank you. Thank you. No, oh, thank you so much. There's so much to talk about. We need to do this clearly uh, much more regularly, uh, connecting transnationally and then pl placing all that action into what we're doing locally. But thank you all so much for making time for this. Thank you for being part of the ArtsLink Assembly. Uh, and we look forward to developing these conversations and seeing you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.